Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast that focuses in on teamwork, leadership, and culture. Hi, I'm Greg Gregory, your host for the Teamwork Advantage. And once a week, we bring you guests to help you focus in and become better at teamwork, leadership, and culture. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Joe Crisillo. And Joe is coming to us out of the Pennsylvania area. And he's got a very, let's just say, diverse and wide background. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of his background and where we get into things as we go along. But for more than 40 years, Joe's had the pleasure of presenting information to audiences in a variety of settings. From the courtroom, yes, he's a recovering lawyer, to the boardroom, to the main stage of arenas, and has relished the opportunity to change the lives of people through critical thinking and persuasive communication. His thought-provoking real-life experiences as a prosecutor, a mentalist, and best-selling behavioral authors made him widely popular and uniquely positioned as a motivational speaker for corporations and organizations working to unify and empower their personnel to achieve greatness as a team. And that is so powerful. His powerful and uh, unifying presentations are a must for many corporations around the world, regardless of the industry. Joe's mission is simple. He's passionate about discovering productivity breakdowns in the workplace, understanding how and why they exist, and designing strategic yet easy to implement solutions. Make sure you stick around to the very end of the podcast. Joe's going to give us a link on how you can get a free, that's a 100% free gift from Joe Carcillo. Joe, welcome to the Teamwork Advantage. I'm glad to be here, Greg. How are you today? We're doing amazingly well, but we are getting Good. better because in my podcast, we always talk about good as just being average. Perfect. That's, uh, I figure if I'm not fabulous, I'm not getting out of bed. That's it. And I've Absolutely gotten out of bed right. consistently, so we're good. Yeah. So I teach teamwork, so I'm all about the we mark of a week. Yep. Oh, nice. Nice. I like that. <laughs> I like that. So, Joe, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. I mean, you've got a background in legal field. You've got a background as a mentalist and an entertainer. You've got a background in speaking. How did you get – let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Uh, once you <laughs> – not, not quite like Steve Martin did in the movie, but let's take it back to uh, an early stage of life. How did you get to where you are? Sure. Um, my journey has been very unique. I've traveled through a lot of, uh, I want to say worlds. Uh, I started in high school. I was aiming to be an artist, thought that's what I was going to do. Uh, then I decided, no, I want to be a civil engineer. I went to engineering school. Then I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, very unfocused. And the truth of the matter is all three of those backgrounds have led me to where I am today. Um, what I have learned through my life is I understand the necessity of details. I also see the big picture. And being a lawyer for 35 years in a courtroom taught me some incredible skills in dealing with people. And the transition for me, uh, and this is where the mentalism came in, Friends of mine said to me, you should be a mentalist. I said, why? They said, well, you're a magician and you're bored with doing it, but you're working all over the place and you hate it. You'll have fun as a mentalist. It's what you do during jury selection. And they were right. Because well, let's, let's, let's step out here for a second. Yeah. What, what is a mentalist and how sure. does it differ from magic? Sure. Uh, um, magicians, as you're talking about magic tricks, the hat's empty, oh, there's a rabbit. In the mentalism world, it's about dealing with thoughts. So there is a degree of what I call magic to it, but it's also human nature, uh, observing people, paying attention to their behaviors. Um, it's, in my world, it's funny because I never, I tell people, I never studied DISC or Meyer Briggs or all those personality tests. I did later in life, but initially I didn't. And what happened is I realized that if I trusted my instincts, I, I was good at understanding what made people tick and why they acted the way they did. And that 
became part of what I do on stage. So mentalism sometimes is just gut instinct and dare I say, intuitive behavior in talking to people. So it's a little different from magic because there's a little more psychology and more human nature and communication skills involved. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure we get the clarity on that because I've always often been confused on it. And it's absolutely intriguing as all, especially when you're watching TV shows and mentalism out there. So let's take it now. So you, you move from the courtroom into being a mentalist. Yeah, and, I, and by the way, let me also say, be part of being a mentalist is having severe OCD because I don't miss too many things. <laughs> so go ahead. I'm sorry. So it, it's interesting because you would be someone I would describe because you're so attentive to detail, but yet you're so much fun. You'd be what I would call a confused person. Is that about oh, right? I, my daughter says I have CDO, which is OCD in alphabetical order. And I have ADD, so I keep forgetting that I'm OCD. Uh, so that's kind of my life, yes. <laughs> okay. I am, um, and that's where I said the art is where it started. So I always maintain the big picture. I, To me, that's what I live with. And I guess the transition I can make on you right now is to say, that is where my book, Getting to Us, and the unifying vision that I write about came from. Because what I realized was that people were micromanaging teams, they were micromanaging people, they were giving people rules, they were giving people policies, but nobody was really focusing on making sure your team enrolled in the vision. And that is what I did with juries for 35 years. My job was to enroll the jury into a unifying vision so I could get them to do what I wanted them to do. And I realized that I could take that to the corporate market and that's when I wrote the book. So um, that I am using that as a transition to my book, but it, it's the reality of it is that's how it was all born. I want to go back and make sure we hit that term you used. Yeah. And I wrote it down here, getting the teams enrolled in the corporate mission and vision. Yes. That is so powerful because if they don't, there's no way they'll be engaged. No, they will not. And let me also indicate and if I can, I want to take what you just said and draw a, put a wedge in it. To me, a corporate mission and a corporate vision are two different things. They're very separate. Yes. I need mission that. is who you are. The vision is where you're going. Uh, it's, and actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this again to you. The mission is where the company wants to go. The vision is where we want to go. Okay. And I mean, we meaning everyone from the top down, every member of the team, it's a we. They have to want to move in that direction or it's not going to happen. Okay. There's that word we, and I think that's a yes. powerful word. So um, you got into mentalism. How did you get into the arena of writing the books that you've written? Because you've written, I believe, four books now. Yeah, uh, three, three, three. Okay. You've got three books. I'm trying to push you for the fourth. Yeah, well, the fourth one's in my head. It's just not on paper yet. That's why I jumped. <laughs> I don't want to commit to a fourth yet. <laughs> I understand that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the concept is there. How did you get into speaking to corporate audiences about that? Mentalism is an entertainment field. Yes. And so how did you get into the corporate ideas of training and things like that? Well, it started, I, I started by training lawyers and doing educational seminars for lawyers. Okay. Then I found myself not speaking as much, although someone said to me once, you were speaking, uh, to CEOs or boards and people that I had as clients or friends or referrals, teaching them how to improve their communication skills to address their people. Okay. That is how that started. And I started doing it. I wasn't, I mean, honestly, I wasn't getting paid for it. I was just doing it because it's what I loved. And as a lawyer, it was way above representing people, but it was still part of me making sure they ran their businesses right. Um, I always had something in my head that said I should write down the way I think, because if I don't write down the way I think, I will forget how I think. So I ended up starting to write and I can tell you my three books each came about differently, 
but they all were released within one year of each other. So they were all concurrently done. Anybody who's ever tried to write a book will tell you that's almost impossible to do. To take three concurrent thoughts in different avenues and not confuse and cross over. Well, if you, if you, I can, I can take a moment and explain how they are concurrent. Okay. okay. Let me start with the unifying vision. That was the book getting to us. My goal was to get everybody to get to an us. And I wanted to write that book because I knew that message was going to be a strong message. And I laughingly say now that all of a sudden people are working remotely and companies are changing how they do business. It's more important now than it was even when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. So that was the dream. Then if we look at the calendar over a period of 10 years leading up to 2018, I had already written my thoughts down. And when you said a fourth book, what I will say is there was a book that I wrote for the performers, for magicians and entertainers called Performance on Trial. It was how to be a better performer. That book over a 10 year period went out of print and morphed into what's your freaking point? Because I realized that teaching people a unifying vision, teaching people how to get from me and you to us could not be done unless people understood communication. So the book on how to communicate was a concurrent thought with where you're going. And then the funny part came when I looked at my editor one day in my office and he looked at me and his statement was, I don't have any clue how you represented some of the worst people on earth, maintained a sense of humor, wrote books, stayed positive and helped people without getting sucked in. And I reached on my, count, my shelf in my roll top desk and I handed him a notebook. And I said, these are the 40 rules I live by. And he said, looked at it and he said, if you can cut down to 30, I think you have another book. <laughs> so I uh, will just grab this. And that was cut down to 30. We got an artist and don't be a hamster came about. And don't be a hamster is simply 30 tips to spark the imagination of busy people. And that was the third book. So it was, again, concurrent through my life that these rules came about. So, yes, that's how you end up with three books in a year. So I took a little long, but it was a weird year. That's absolutely fascinating. So let's get, I want to, and, and it's how you do things and how a mind works that obviously that's part of what you do with the mentalist. But it, it, to me, it's fascinating to watch how different people work and having the ability to interview so many different folks. And by the way, I think I mentioned earlier, I think you are a fourth uh, recovering lawyer uh, on the uh, Teamwork Advantage podcast. So it's fascinating and how they've gone through different industries. It's, it's absolutely a kind of a wonderful uh, aspect to look at. Your book, Getting to Us, you mentioned it earlier, and it's about the unifying mission. And I, I just want to address something in there because chapter three is the unifying mission. And to many people, when you think about unifying mission, getting everybody there, everybody thinks that's a bunch of hoo-ha. Tell us why it's not and then give us a little synopsis on how an organization can get there, whether they're in a leadership role or whether they're in a frontline role. Um, sure. Let, let, let's start with what I want to call the most important ingredient. People want a purpose. Mm -hmm. People need to have purpose. We don't want to wander through life aimlessly. We want to have purpose. We want to have meaning. That has been a quest of humans since day one. Well, it used to be in the workplace, you could offer your employees more money and incentive programs, and they would stick around. Not anymore. But then they can go somewhere else and get the incentives. And I always use the example, if you stay with an insurance company long enough, they raise their rates on you, and then you go find another insurance company and they take it back down to the beginning again. Someone is always willing to give you an incentive to get you on board, but then it runs out. 
But if you can give someone a purpose, if you can give them meaning, if you can give them something where they say, I believe in this, and you give them purpose, meaning, and the ability to achieve that, they will work to do that for themselves and you concurrently. That is my strong belief. Okay. So I don't think it's woo-woo. I don't think it's far-fetched. Mm -hmm. I think the happiest people in employment are those that feel like they are contributing to a cause. And if people feel like they're making a contribution and they're respected for that, you, you've got them. So the vision that can make that happen is the one that unifies them. Now, let's talk about that for a second. You were fortunate enough to become very good friends with a gentleman that I only had the privilege to meet a few times. Yep. The name was Charlie Tremendous Jones. Yep. And Charlie's famous quote that I always remember is, in five years from today, you'll be the same person you are today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Absolutely. And is that kind of where you got your burning passion in there? Or did you have that before you got to know Charlie? Oh, no, no. Um, I, I, Charlie, Charlie was one of, uh, I mean, just truly a best friend. He was one of my best friends. I spent more time with Charlie. Um, in fact, at some point or another, my wife used to call his wife to find out if that's where I was. <laughs> um, he really, you know, he was a great man. And, and I got to say that. And what he did was pushed on me an incredible desire to learn, a desire to be better than I am today tomorrow, make it better. He introduced me to some really powerful people. He introduced me to some incredible books. And it's funny because every time I would look at him at the time, in the beginning of our relationship, I worked in the government and I hated it. And he would always say to me, shut up and learn. Shut up. You're getting something out of it. Stop whining. Stop being a thumb sucker. You'll learn. You'll learn. And I realized that that's exactly what I was doing. And I think what he gave me was an incredible desire to be aware of what I was learning. So if there's a message in it, the message is this, I don't go to bed at night until I reflect on what I learned that day. It might be a new person, it might be a new book, it might be a new failure, it might be a new success. There's always something to be learned. And that is what Charlie taught me. So I want to say over a period of uh, 20, 15 years of my life, 20 years of my life, I really tracked a lot of that. So I started to figure out why I did things and what I did. And I paid attention to the details in my own life so I could see my own life as a big picture. Are there times that you go through and ask yourself that question, what did you learn? And sometimes, as you mentioned, it could be something that was negative or wrong. Yeah. And what did you do? What empowered you to change the next day? Um, I'm sorry. I'm laughing as you asked that because I'm thinking that when you ask about what do I learn from the mistakes or failures, my immediate memory is the time I flipped over a caterpillar telehandler in my yard and ended up getting nine stitches in my chin. So the answer was, after the doctor stitched me up and I woke up in pain, I learned a valuable lesson, which is, Joe, don't ever operate heavy equipment again. Um, and that was a lesson that I carry with me. So <laughs> I, I always say, you know, that sometimes they're bad ideas. Um, but to me, I, I tell that story to you because the reality of it is there's things that we do where I could look at myself and say, I flipped over this piece of machinery. There was a lot of damage to it. I was damaged. But the funny part is it's because this giant piece of equipment went out of balance. And what I realized the next day was don't operate heavy equipment. But I also realized that I flipped it and it's going to sound so corny i flipped it because i wasn't in the moment i was watching something external from this this giant piece of equipment 
And I wasn't there. So maybe I'm going to use the catchphrase. I wasn't present. I wasn't in the moment. So what I learned was, Joe, if you're not in the moment, you're going to get stitches in your chin. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of yeah. a breakdown, but you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So yeah. that lesson has traveled with me. And, and by that's the a way, powerful my wife, lesson. My wife will bring that up every chance she gets. Good. Every time she sees something that looks like heavy equipment, she tells somebody, hold Joe back. So <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure you've read the book, Fish. Yes, yes. And that be present is one of the principles in the book, Fish. Yes. Yep. And so it's, it's so relevant how these, everything comes back. And I had the privilege to interview um, uh, one of the authors of the book, Fish, uh, on there. And we still talked about it. it's 25 years old and everything is still so powerful working in that direction. Well, and, and I'm going to add and say, I sometimes have been known to paraphrase, as you said, Charlie's statement is, you'll be the same person today as you are in five years, except for two things, the people you read in the books you, the people you meet in the books you read. And for me, it's, and the mistakes you've made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, I've learned a lot and I, you know, and I tell people at, at my, you know, my age in life, I can teach you more about mistakes than I can about anything. And that to me is the key to success. Okay. Let's go back to your other book. Yes. The hamster book. Sure. Pull that up again. I want, I want to show the, I want to show the cover of that book. I and mean, if you're, if you're only listening to this, you need to make sure you get to go out and at least look at this online. You know, it says, don't be a hamster 30 ways to spark imagination of busy people. Um, the cover is fascinating folks. You're going to want to take a look at this. So Joe, if you could just grab I don't know, one, two, three items out of there sure. to help busy people get off the hamster wheel of life. Yeah. Um, what is it that does it? I can, speaking from my personal life, one of the things I did is I, I bought a house, sold a house and moved, keyword and moved in a period of 37 days this year. Okay. And that got me off a big hamster wheel. Any major shock will get you off a hamster wheel. That's yes. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes they, 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 you need to get back on a little bit of a hamster wheel so you can keep progressing because otherwise you get knocked off and then you're just turmoil. Yeah. Don't ever but, stay off of it. Yeah. Yeah. But so give us a couple of things okay. that are in the book there. And some of your, your golden rules, if you will. I'll go random. Let's see. Oh, there we go. I'm going random. So I, it's number eight is make a time plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that came about for me because I wanted to make sure that I had control of my life in some respect and I didn't get sucked into things. So here I am as a lawyer and I'm, I'm not going with what the book says. I want to go with the thought process behind it is I would represent people who were horrible. I had to interview them. I had to go to court with them. Um, I also represented some really nice people, but that roller coaster ride was crazy. So every Sunday night I would sit down and go through my calendar and I would schedule my to-do list in time blocks on my calendar. And I honored those appointments as if they were external, meaning I have no control over them. I must do them at that time. You honored them as appointments. Yes. And I also scheduled free time and Joe time. So I would even schedule and say, I'm not taking any phone calls for two hours from 12 to two. And it didn't say I'm going to lunch. It doesn't say I'm I'm just not, I'm not taking phone calls. And when that 12 to two on Thursday would come, I'd sit there and say, what am I doing? And I'd find a book on my shelf to read. I would find something to do to divert myself. But by having that time plan, what I learned that was valuable was making sure that I was capable of controlling my schedule, who I was around, what I was around, and what was happening in advance. And by the way, as a lawyer, um, there's a lesson to be learned because by scheduling the to-do list, I actually scheduled what I called billable time on the calendar so I could sit back on Sunday and know how much money I was going to make during the week if I kept my calendar. So no matter what business you're in, you have to know what your hourly worth is. And know that if you're fixing your time on your calendar, you're controlling your own worth. Um, so, and as I say in the book, what I just told you, you can tell that to a hamster. 
You can pour it a glass of wine, hand it a planning calendar, calendar, but it's still going to eat, run in its wheel and sleep because that's what hamsters do. So I'm hoping the people that hear me don't get in the wheel and run and not do it. You know, yeah. learn to do that. Yeah. Um, I just flipped to an, oh, there's one of my favorites. Oh, hey, before you hit to the next yeah. one, one of my favorite phrases is knowledge is not power without application. Absolutely. So get off the hamster wheel and take action is what you're in essence saying in that mode. Absolutely. And by the way, every one of them runs with, you can tell this to a hamster, but the hamster's not going to do it. Um, and that's kind of the message. And I had to remind myself over and over again. Um, by the way, the next one I opened to randomly is my favorite, which is learn to say no. Uh, uh, okay. Hang on. I need to get something out so I can take detailed please, notes on this please, part. Whatever you want. Because I suffer from that. So what, what's the whole deal about saying no? The whole deal for me about saying no is I know my time is valuable. I don't let anyone else put a price on my time. So if someone is asking me to do something, my recommendation is, and I tell people it's what I do and I suggest you do it. Think about what they're asking and don't say yes until you've evaluated several things. One is, is it going to match your time value? Is this something that's going to bring you value in your time? Number two, is it something that's going to further your plan or goals? Or third, is it going to sufficiently move your relationship with that individual forward so that the first two are negated? And that's purely what I call the networking R. Sometimes I say yes, because it's going to improve my relationship with somebody. So if somebody says to me, do this, I have to know that I can help them and it's going to benefit them, but also too, there's a point in life where you got to say to yourself, is this going to move me forward? Because if you keep saying yes, you're going to be stuck in a position where you're not moving forward, no matter how loved you are. Yeah, you're going to be driving an Indy 500 car in the desert, spinning, yep. spinning in a lot, making a lot of noise and going nowhere. Right. So you've got to make sure you learn to balance out your time. So, okay, let's grab one more. One more. Let's grab I one. Even look. I'm just looking at my wall of guitars, and there's one of my hamsters playing a guitar. Because one of my rules is get a hobby. Get a hobby. It's that simple. Find something you like to do. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you to meditate, and I do recommend that. That's another one of the rules. But what's that one? Is a medi meditate. Meditate. I was like, okay, meditate. Got it. But I always tell people sometimes meditation is different. Find a hobby, something you can say, I'm going to do something that is fun, exciting. Uh, for me, I am the world's worst guitarist, and I'm proud of being the world's worst guitarist. But playing the guitar is my happy place. It's so what do you say to people who say, entrepreneurs in particular here, what do you say to entrepreneurs who say, I love what I do. My, my work is my hobby. Yeah, um, here's the problem. <laughs> I am, you're talking to someone who, to me, my idea of a part-time job is anything that's less than 18 to 19 hours a day, okay? I work constantly. My life, work-life balance from an outward standpoint is sucky. People can look at me and say, Jerry, what are you doing? You're not even balanced. Yeah, I am, and I'll tell you why. Because as much fun as I have as a speaker, as much fun as I have writing, as much fun as I have consulting and coaching my clients, I love what I do. But what makes me better at doing all of that is the time that I take for me to have a hobby that removes me from all of that, because that is what keeps your mind open. And again, we go back to the beginning when I was an artist. That was something I did for me, and it improved my ability to see details. It improved my ability to analyze a big picture. If I didn't take the time to do that, and by the way, painting is another one of my hobbies, because it gives me a chance to study things in a way I wouldn't normally study them. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't take the time to do that, no matter how much your work is your hobby, no matter how much you love what you're doing, you need to grow. Um, I'm just laughing as I say this, but I just painted a scene. It's a beach scene. And my wife looked at the painting and said to me, that really looks like sand. And then she looked at the palette and said, what are all these colors? And I said, you see sand. I see red, pink, brown, blue, yellow, and white. And she just laughed at me and shook her head and went, oh, now I see it. Well, sometimes being out of your comfort zone and doing something different, like a hobby, gives you that perspective. And it was so fun for me to look at my wife and go, see, you took the time to look, now you see it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to do with company executives because sometimes they're buried up to their necks and they love what they do. But mm -hmm. I love to knock them off the top and say, hey, separate yourself, take a look, see what yeah. it really looks like. Yeah. And to me, a hobby of that nature is a lot more fun than therapy. Absolutely. Because now, now you're, you're spending money on it, but you're, you're doing something you like and it's not necessarily paying somebody else a therapy bill. Absolutely. And, and when I'm done building my beach house, it'll give me something to hang in my beach house. So there's two, two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, that's, it's so important because we've got to have fun at work. Yeah. Yep. How and you... by the way, even when I was a lawyer, I mean, I worked long hours. Mm -hmm. I worked crazy hours, but I basically had no problem just telling my entire staff that we're going to have a milkshake afternoon. And I brought in milkshakes just to shake them up and do something different and force them to sit around the conference table and just have fun for a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. I've got one of my clients. They actually, uh, every Friday, well, this was pre pandemic, of course, every Friday, the CEO and the C-suite would go around the office uh, with fresh uh, pop popcorn, not microwave popcorn fresh popped popcorn and walk it around and give it to all the employees and the staff. That's beautiful. beautiful. You know, yeah. it's, it's those types of things that people think is stupid. No, it's not. It, it's absolutely not because we've got to enjoy what we do. I mean, the, the phrase has been so overused and yet it is so valuable. And that is you'll never work another day in your life when you love what you do. Absolutely. On the same token, not only you have to love what you do, but you got to have fun at work, but you also have to find outside of work. And there's nothing wrong with learning to love more than one thing. Yes. And I say thing, because if I don't say thing, then my wife will shoot me. Because yes, because it's not people. people. That's right. Not people. Well, you can love more than one person. <laughs> I know, you but got I'm, kidding. Kids, I'm joking. <laughs> kids, dogs. Yes, I get that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so go back in your book. Um, getting to us. I know I'm bouncing all over the place. Oh, today, you're absolutely fascinating to just chat with, but in your book, getting to us. Yeah. Communication is the foundation of everything. There's no doubt about it. Yep. And it's not just the words we say, it's our body language. Absolutely. You can sit there and go, and everybody's watching this on video. Hi, I'm a very happy person. And if you got that fake grit, it's just not right. Right. And the opening story in your book is absolutely fascinating, again, because it's about a customer service experience. And when we stop to think about customer service, it's not just an end user of service. This could be a colleague as a customer. It's yeah. important we understand the different people. So you want to share with us that little story about what happened in that? Sure. Um, it was a, the, the, the story I start with is I walked into a resort, I would say a magical resort in Orlando, Florida that will remain nameless. And as I wandered into the resort, there was long lines and everybody in line was miserable. And um, I renamed the desk clerk as I've always pictured him as Ed the Boy Scout. This kid was behind the desk and without going into the whole literary discussion I have about him, the bottom line is he was trained what to say. He was trained with a script. He was told with his bosses what to say. And what I will tell you is as we were trying to check in, there were no staff at the desk. The entire lobby was a construction zone. And he just went through the script. 
And he said what he was supposed to say, but I could have been wearing a clown mask and he would have said the same thing. I could have been Jeff Bezos and he would have said the same thing. It was people being trained to do something without being given the ability to relate to the human standing across the counter. And that in essence is what it was. And I then, while I'm waiting, by the way, they did not have my room ready, which was the whole thing. I went to the little restaurant and I'm in the restaurant and the waitress came over to my table and literally looked at me and said something to the extent of, you look exhausted. And I said, I need coffee. And she came back and said, the coffee machine's broken. So I brought you a triple espresso. I think it's what you need. <laughs> and I, I stared at her and I thanked her and her boss is like stomping around, yelling at her for not moving the tables fast enough. But the funny part is she, and I'm going to shift to an why she fascinated me so much is she's in the same resort you know she's given a script but instead of just following a script she listened to me without me saying a word yeah and if you listen to people you don't have to hear them no you'll feel them and i'm going to just say a lot of people talk about body language and what I, you know, and I, I talk about some of that stuff in my keynotes, but to me, I don't get hung up on body language rules. We've all had experiences with people. Just look at somebody. Stop thinking in your head about the rules of body language. Just look at the person and, and observe see what their face tells you. You're yeah. going to be right. And I did this with jury selection throughout my entire career. I've got more jury trials under my belt than I probably ever dreamt of. And every one of them, I would look at people that I'm picking as a jury and I would read their face to see how they looked at me, how they acted. And uh, that's what happened in that moment is she looked at me and went, how am I going to make this guy happy? And she, well, and anybody that brings me coffee makes me happy. But she brought me a triple espresso, you know? I was almost ready to call my wife and say, honey, I'm not coming home. Um, but this person made me feel so welcomed and happy to be in that moment mm -hmm. that it made everything go away. Um, and that's a short version of what's in the book, but that, that is what started me realizing how much companies needed to understand that their scripts aren't working anymore. Yeah, it's not. Um, no. And the same thing in real reality, because so many folks with the pandemic, they've now reverted to a lot of organizations working from home, especially in call centers um, and help desks. And so they're all constantly working from home and they're relying on their knowledge base. Yeah. So they'll type in a question that you may have and they're just reading from a script at that point. Yeah. Oh, I, OK. So I'm not going to throw any particular entity under a bus but uh yesterday i had a charge on my uh cell phone bill for a piece of equipment that was not returned and it was a thousand dollar charge for the phone that had to be sent back for repairs and i called up and i said we sent the phone back i have a confirming email can I give you the confirmation number so that you can take the thousand dollars off of my bill? And the woman said to me, sir, do you remember the date that you sent the phone back? I said, no, ma'am, but I can give you the confirmation number. Sir, do you remember what shipping company you used to send it back? And I said, whatever one you sent me a label for that I put in your box with your label, can I give you the confirmation number? And then she said, well, sir, I'm going to have to check with my supervisor because if you don't know how you sent it back, I'm not sure I can help you. And I said, ma'am, can I give you the confirmation number? She said, I have to check with my supervisor, to which I said, 
please, I beg you, go off script and listen to me. And she put me on hold for 10 minutes. <laughs> but oh, it's like, wow. I want I, to give you the number. I'm going to solve both of our problems. And, but no, she was on a script. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. saying, just please go off of it, please. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like the last week I was having to deal with a scanner issue because of different things. It's like it stopped working from day one to day two and nothing changed. Yeah. And I ended up calling the company and I got a level one tech support guy. And he was on the phone for 45 minutes. He was trying everything. He was listening. He was doing exactly what he's supposed to do. And he finally came back out and said, I can't help any further. He said, I apologize. He says, I'm going to set you up for a level two tech support callback. He said, they, they will call back within four hours. He called me back. The guy called me back within two hours. We went through the things. He said, I've read the case notes. I understand what's going on. He said, let's try one thing. That didn't work. And he said, let's try this. And he did something else and it worked. The bottom line was the first guy couldn't help me, but it's not because he didn't try and go off script. He couldn't help because it, it was beyond his thought capacity. Right. And he worked with somebody else. Yeah. So let's take this now from a customer standpoint yep. and put this into a manager leader. Right. How can a manager or leader better telepathically communicate with his or her staff direct front line, or even a generation below that, what message can they do? How can they bring the team better and easier get to us? Number one, put your team first. When you think about them, when you speak to them, when you plan, put them first. And I'm not the customer. No, well, let me, let me back this up for a moment. Okay. When we deal with customers, we create an external image that we're putting the customer first. Mm -hmm. But when we deal with employees, we don't take the time to create any image. We don't take the time to put our employees first. So, you know, I always think of the old, uh, if, if you're familiar, there's an, a Connecticut based store, Stu Leonard's and Stu Leonard um, is a dairy store. Okay. And they are notorious and I'm going to go date myself, but they were a big deal in the old Earl Nightingale days because they're the ones that started the motto of the customer is always right. And rule two is the cuff, if the customer is wrong, see rule one. Well, the truth of the matter is that's how they treated the customers. The interesting thing is I've been in the stores and here we are years later, the stores still survive. They still have that motto but they treat the employees first. The employees yeah. are the most important people in the world. They are the ones that want to carry out the mission of putting the customer first because they know they're first. They know they're part of a unified team that it's not one standing alone getting shot down by a manager. They're all in this together and they work together. And it's, it's actually in a great environment to wander into. And that is when you put your client, your, if you put your employees first, you give them trust, you give them the power to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Your customers will be first to the employees. Yes. So for me, you know, if, if I'm working now in a different world, but when I was a lawyer, I put my employees first. I tried to do everything they needed me to do. I tried to fill their needs, hear what they wanted. It was their job to put the clients first. And they did because they knew that I cared and they wanted to carry out that mission. Um, you know, so I always say that, and that's what I learned as a trial lawyer. Uh, I always put the jury first. When I spoke to the jury, I knew they didn't want to be there. I knew that if they could have gotten out of that courtroom, they would have run, you know, I mean, they oh, I had stories made up ready to go for the trial, whenever I got jury duty. Yeah. Oh no. It, 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 they're the ones that couldn't, the people sitting on jury are the ones that couldn't come up with an excuse or they're the ones that just put it off so many times that they had nowhere else to be. And if I spoke to them like a pontificating lawyer, they would want me dead. No, I had to make sure they knew I understood their pain, but they also had to understand I needed them to do the right thing. And that is what gave them the power to then give me my verdict. So it's always a matter of put the person first because 
And people say, how do you know what puts them first? The answer is look at them. Look and listen. No, look at their circumstances. Look why they're there. And by the way, I'll throw in one of my favorite comments is when you're talking to people. Uh, I always get into this and I, my whole career, I always ask people, what is the opposite of talking? And most people tell me it's listening. It's not. The opposite of talking is waiting to speak. Listening uses your ears, not your mouth. So I always tell people, yeah, not talking means someone else is talking and you're waiting to speak. Since you're not doing anything else, you might as well listen. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening, the next thing you say will be that much more relevant. Yeah. And, I, you know, I yeah. watch lawyers questioning witnesses and they're reading off a script and they ask the witness something and they look at a witness and say, and then you look through the window and did you see the guy in the green coat? And the person says, no. Well, how do you sure it was a green coat? What? Are you sure it was a green coat? No, the person just said they didn't see it. But then the lawyer looks up and goes, what did you just say? Yeah. No, stop reading your script. Just ask the question and hear what the answer is. And I used to train young lawyers on that. So I now I get to watch uh, corporate executives do it. And it's not bad. It's just normal. It's what we do. Right. We so worried about what we have to say. We don't listen. We don't pay. And that, and that was going to be the next question was, what do you as a former trial lawyer have to offer business people, whether it's frontline employees all the way through the C-suite? What do you have to offer that is unique from what, you know, a management company, your management training company has to offer? Sure. Um, let me start by saying, uh, let's start off with the normal check boxes people are looking for, which is I served on multiple boards of directors and ran charities. I served as president of several boards to run charities. I ran my own law firm. I ran a title agency. So yeah, I did all the CEO check boxes and all the management stuff. But as a lawyer, I communicated with people in a life and death situation. I, when I titled my book, What's Your Freaking Point? Maximize the impact of every word you speak. I lived in a world where if I spoke the wrong words, my client went to jail. And if I spoke the wrong words, my client might have had a verdict against them for everything they own. Every word matters. So mm -hmm. I have learned to use what we all think of as speech. I have learned to use them as weapons of war and weapons of peace. Um, I, I taught a law school course and it was entitled Sun Tzu and Storytelling as Warfare. And I have mastered the art of presenting information to people in a way that they can accept it, digest it, and act on it. And that is what I bring to the table. And that's things that, regardless of your position, mm -hmm. regardless of the position, getting them to take action, getting them to want to buy in, getting them to want to be a part of is absolutely critical. And that, by you being able to do that with them and teaching them in turn how to do that with others, we start to build a, a, a very powerful group. Yeah, and if your team understands how to communicate from the bottom up and the leaders know how to communicate from the top down. There's your happy medium. Yeah. And so often people don't know how to communicate from the bottom up. Right. In our closing moments, is there anything that you can give us as an example or a technique for someone to be able to communicate from the bottom up? Um, well, let me start with a phrase that I would say is allow yourself to be human. Um, it, it's funny. I, uh, it, it's kind of going to answer your question, but in a roundabout way, 
um, which is when I was a juvenile judge, I dealt with juveniles and uh, I had juveniles came in front of me and every six months I had to review to decide if they stayed in juvenile detention or if they went free. Well, I'm sitting up there and every six months, this kid named Kenny would come in front of me and he would curse me out and I would lock him up and they would take him out of the courtroom. And this went on from the time he was about 14 till shortly before his 21st birthday. And I locked him up the last time because he cursed me out. But that time I looked at him and I said, Kenny, next time I see you, either you are going to be a successful adult husband and father, or you're going to be in prison. I hope it's the former. They took him out of the courtroom. Six years later, my office manager tells me, Joe, there's someone here to see you named Kenny. I completely forgot about the kid. I come down the steps. I walk into my waiting room and there's a six foot tall kid and as I looked at him I remembered this is Kenny I thought I was going to die I figured it was over he was coming back to kill me make a long story short we ended up in the conference room he reaches into his jacket I took a deep breath <laughs> and next thing I know he hands me a photograph to look at and I said what is this and I looked at this woman and he said this is the woman I'm marrying on Saturday She's pregnant. I'm going to have a child. Can you come to the wedding? Wow. And I said, I, I, I can't make it Saturday. I'm going to be out of town. But Kenny, wait a minute. What happened? And he looked at me and said, you gave me a choice. No one ever gave me a choice before. Yeah. And I realized that I gave him that choice. And what that led to was him coming to communicate with me and show me his success. So I gave him the choice. And that is what created in his mind, a six year change of life where he came back to me to communicate. And that's what people want. They want to know they have a choice to make. And I do believe people will make the right one. And getting those choices, regardless of the position is important. Absolutely. You know, and, so whether it's front, top down or bottom up, yeah. everybody wants a choice. And by the way, from the top down and the bottom up, I always say the harsh reality and we'll end with my harsh reality is some people don't belong on the team. <laughs> and that's really a tough call for a lot of leaders. Yeah. And got to get them off the bus. Jim Collins talked about that yeah. in good and good to great a lot. Yep, absolutely. There's sometimes you just have to say this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're a bad person they no. just don't belong on your bus nope um i i've had lawyers that didn't belong on my bus and i found them other jobs i found them places to go where they would fit in mm -hmm. because i found buses that would be comfortable and happy to have them yeah. it's just my bus wasn't and that's making sure they, they they may not align with your vision but they may align with somebody else's vision absolutely Abs uh -huh. or actually somebody's vision might align with them yes it's the yes. opposite is what I look for. So, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Joe Cursillo, it has been absolutely fascinating to listen to your stories. Uh, we've all got to get off the hamster wheel. As we get ready to close, we can have folks just simply text. And I think the word they want to text is the word shark. Yes. Is that right? Text the word shark to 66866. Text shark to 66866. Sign up to my mailing list and you will immediately get an email that contains a PDF of the first four chapters of getting to us as a free gift. Text the word shark to six, six, eight, six, six. And I'll put that back in the show notes for folks, but you can get the first four copies of Joe's book and a couple of the stories talking about the uh, hotel in Orlando and the unifying mission are just parts of that. Joe, it's been a privilege to have you as part of the guest here on the teamwork advantage and Hopefully we can get you back here again one day uh, in the near future. Thank you, Greg. It's been an honor to be here. I enjoy sharing time with you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, I once a week, folks, so, I'm sorry? I appreciate being part of your team. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, folks, we share skills and ideas that you can act on immediately. Joe's definitely give us several of those here today. Until next week, remember, having a good day is just being average. 
When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know you're not average. So go make today an excellent and exceptional day. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.